Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Mick Kirsten. I'm the CEO of Tasta Up Technologies, and I create the Eclipse Milan project. I'm joined here with by Greg Stachnik. Greg is a product manager of Oracle Developer Tools, and Steve Spiker, who's the lead architect of OSLC at IBM, and we'll explain what that acronym stands for shortly, or Steve will actually. So we're going to talk today about how to link your application lifecycle. So there's been a lot of change in our life cycles. Hudson and continuous integration have become a really key part of it. But to really make that work and really make it effective, you need to hook it up to the rest of your tool chain. So you need to hook it up to your other developer tools, other tools that are involved in you know, basically your, your ALM stack, your application lifecycle management stack. And I'll just start with a quick story of what happens when, when companies fail to do that. So this is the 787. It was the often delayed plane that's, that's now flying. In, uh, I think it was 2011, it saw another delay. And the article in the Seattle Times newspaper was the, the GM of the project, the general manager, saying it's not that the brakes didn't work, it's that they had a problem with the traceability of the software. That's the actual quote. And then it didn't go into it any more than that. Um, I've actually had a chance to chat about this with Boeing folk, folks since then and looked into it. What happened is that they were outsourcing their brake software. I think it was going through General Electric to some French subcontractor who did the software. The brake software was all done to spec. Everything worked. Everything passed the test. And then Boeing realized that they didn't have any traceability between the requirements for the brakes and the source code they got. So they had none of those links between those two. They have to maintain the software. There's a fair amount of software in that plane. They have to maintain that software and that brake system and the rest of the plane for 35 years that the plane is in active production and another 35 years of maintenance. So around a 70-year maintenance window that they deal with. And the sort of maturity that they have around understanding software delivery as a result of that, as a result of you know, the very large cost that they assume on maintenance, they realized the right thing to do was to throw out that brake software and rewrite from scratch. Because adding traceability after the fact is, you know, it's, it's very difficult. So that's exactly what they did. And there was another few month delay, which I imagine would be fairly expensive as well. So what's been happening is that we've, our tool stacks have gotten more and more complex. We've been pulling out over the last decade that actually Steve used, used to work on, on ClearQuest, right? As people have been <laughs> pulling out Steve's previous tool, tool chain from you know, their large scale software delivery and adding more modern tools, whether it's the more modern IBM tools like Rational Team Concert, some of the you know, lightweight things, subversion's gone into a lot of our, our organizations, a lot of our firewalls. Git's popular now. As we've been pulling out the, and changing and evolving the tools that we use, we've actually lost some of that traceability. I mean, the amazing thing about ClearQuest and the Rational Unified process was that everything was connected, everything was linked. It was not done in a way where developers were happy because there was you know, sort of very onerous tools, there were a lot of fields to complete, and the lightweight stuff like the Jira's, Bugzilla's, tracks kind of disrupted that, and the lightweight SCM tools disrupted that. But in the end, to have software that's easy to maintain, uh, we need that stuff back, that stuff that, that the ClearQuest, ClearCase stack had, the stuff that the Rational Unified process had, but in this new modern stack. And we're going to talk today and show you some demos of how we've done that. As you know, so one example on the Eclipse Milan project that we work on, every single line of code is linked back to a Bugzilla bug. And we'll show you how we added some of that tooling to make that possible. We do not take patches from anybody in the ecosystem if they're not linked, if they don't have the context and that traceable information, because we know then that we're just adding technical debt to our software. For us, it's not the seven-year lifespan. It's the fact that we have a small set of committers maintaining that code base, and we know we can't assume that kind of debt by losing that traceability. So, one other interesting aspect of this is that the, it, things have gotten complex enough in the way that we're doing software delivery that this traceability, we'll show you some, some examples of how you can hook up around Hudson, around the Oracle Developer Cloud Service that you might have seen other parts of the conference or on Thomas Kurian's keynote. This traceability has to both work within the projects that you're working on, within your organization, but also across it, across different organizations. So the co problem gets more complex. And we'll show you some of the web standards uh, that Steve and his teams and we've been working on uh, to make this possible. Because that Boeing example was actually involved multiple organizations. So Boeing was doing the requirements. Who knows what SCM system and issue tracker 
uh, that outsourced organization was using. If parts of your software stack are being done by other teams and other organizations, possibly because, let's say, you know, you're, you're depending on an open source component that's hosted at Apache, if your lifecycle is not connected to basically what's your software supply chain, to the fact that a chunk of your software is being made on Apache by committers on Apache, if that information is not linked, you don't know when there's been four new security defects raised and you might be exposing credit card information. So this linking, as, as our stacks get more heterogeneous as, and as the software lifecycle evolves, so we're, we're consuming you know, both jars from other organizations, also web services, we actually need to keep this kind of linking traceability in mind both within our organization and across it. So, you know, we've got these, within the company, we've got these different scenarios, we've got different roles working on different parts of the software. Um, they're using, di and the key thing is that they're using different systems. Those requirements are living in a different system from the issues, that's living in a different system from, and probably from a different supplier than where you got the source code from. And we've got to, in the end, we've got to link these things. We've got to get to the point, yeah, question? No, it's a small enough group. Cool. Go ahead. Um, so Jenkins versus Hudson, are they the same thing? I think there must be another session on that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so the things that you hear here will apply to Jenkins as well. Those tools are, are, they are very similar. They've forked, they've got different you know, sets of plugins. But yeah, we're f focusing on Hudson here. And we've, in the demos, you'll see Hudson integrated into this tool chain. The so it's just an open source community split. You know, long ago, XC Max and Emacs, that split happened. Right. So it's, there tends to be like misalignment on community direction and so on, and, and that happened with Hudson and Jenkins. If you Google for it, you can spend the rest of the <laughs> talk reading about it. So. Um, all right, so we want to get to the point where everything is connected. You know, whether you, when you, especially, and there's a nice opportunity now happening with your applications getting hosted. So, I mean, on the pass, so say on the Oracle Cloud. So we're actually going to show you how when everything is hosted, we can link everything up in this very transparent way around the central build engine. And in this case, that's Hudson. Before we do that, Steve is going to take you through some of the issues with, you know, what's happened with things not being linked and some of the technology foundations and the, and the standards now being worked on to make it possible to wire up these disconnected tools. Then we'll go into a demo of what that can look like. Uh, thanks, Mick. Um, I, I might add on one interesting story to the 787. I don't know if you've heard this one before. So the picture, maybe I should move back to it. Um, I think of 40 clicks. Yeah, never mind. I won't do that. Um, <laughs> so imagine um, there was the, the, the taking off, and there's the, the exit door there. In order to save money, they reused the design from a previous aircraft so they could just plug it in. But they were going to move the ashtray from the, the armrest. But it turns out the cost to do that I forget the millions it costs because they have to recertify that part now to fly. So now even though there's no chance you can smoke, <laughs> it now has an ashtray in the door. Wow. Uh, anyways, just showing the cost to, to change anything. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about what's uh, going on around. Uh, so I work in, in IBM in the rational division and have worked over the years on uh, uh, not just product development but integration. So if we look past, and I just picked some, some dates here of the, the way the history of tools have gone. You, uh, you can look at uh, maybe 1995, whatever the date might be. Uh, the focus was around uh, specialized tools. For example, a modeling tool that can really generate some, some kick-ass code from it, a uh, requirements tool that can do you know, some interesting traceability within its own world. Uh, but they often focused within their own world of how they operated. And so the, the motivation behind tools getting better was you know, this, those individual tools uh, meeting their needs. There was a uh, limited need to, to work together. So fast forward five years or so, then we say, boy, we really need to start sharing information between these tools. But these tools have always been built with the mindset of, you know, I, I'm getting this line item done, I shipped, great, oh, now let's worry about integration. And when we worry about integration, then it's like, oh, what, what APIs do I have available? Sometimes they're public, sometimes they're not. Uh, often a third party has to come together and tease into those, uh, those endpoints and pull the, the data together. And it's a bit clumsy, fragile. And then if you connect two tools that way, um, you're often locked into, because these APIs are 
are based on often uh, the technology, certain Java API level, uh, maybe it's uh, Perl based, command line, all these various things. But now if you want to upgrade one of these tools, you have to almost upgrade the integration as well and the tool on the other end. And then if you take that pattern and repeat it over here for another set of tools, uh, all of a sudden you, you almost can't upgrade anything without upgrading everything. So, um, so we're looking at a better way to do this. So we've uh, not only looked at technology ways of do this, but the approach on how we do it. Um, you know, we could have gotten together within uh, IBM and our, our, our redundant tools, if you will. They're not, you know, we've, we have a history with a big company. Uh, legacy tools, uh, next generation tools, acquired tools. So we have uh, often things that overlap a little bit and they're, they're purpose built. And what we want these things to integrate better together, even within. Uh, but the reality was, well, how do we get our partners involved? How do we get our customers involved? And why not even uh, get our, our competitors involved in, in, in all this uh, process? So uh, then we, we, we looked at the better way in, as an approach to uh, link these things together using uh, the internet's style of, of linking. So instead of uh, uh, focusing on uh, language specific APIs, product specific APIs, we'll look towards open protocols. And we'll, we'll, we'll describe how we're going to work together, how, how these tools are gonna work together based on some, some minimal scenarios. So we'll look at what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we won't, we're not trying to reinvent, solve the world's problem, but we're trying to make valuable steps where uh, we can get value from it. So we iterate over some uh, common scenarios, provide just enough uh, uh, specification, and then uh, 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 work towards implementation to do this. So we've, we've worked together out in this community uh, with a number of folks uh, like Mick and uh, TaskTop, uh, folks from Oracle as well, and have uh, tested and, and, and used this approach. So this approach, the uh, linking data isn't something that is, is necessarily new or different or specific to, to ALM. Um, you can look at other uh, domains as well. If you look at uh, healthcare and life sciences, one of, the, uh, one of the problems you often see is around uh, handling, uh, so you have a couple different parties involved. So of course the patient who's uh, taking some type of drug, whether it's part of a, uh, some type of trial or whether it's really a part of their, their medication. Uh, they have the, the problem of I now need to, uh, uh, as a as a med as my doctor, and I go to report my issues. Like, oh, okay, you're taking this medication. Oh, let's see what the problems are. So, looking around, you know, common problems they see with somebody taking this, but also they have to report some of these issues back as part of the drug trial uh, to the original uh, to the the drug manufacturer, and then also uh, regulatory requirements to push it back to uh, you know the FDA or, or whoever it might might be. Uh, and the, the problem uh, we, that's changed over time a bit, but the problem uh, is often that when you, you know, say I'm a, a, a medical unit that, uh, or doctor's office, I want to participate in a drug trial with uh, some patients, uh, I'm often handed a computer or something to report that. So not only do I have the system to manage the, the patient, I have the system uh, to, to uh, report information to whatever uh, drug manufacturer for how many I'm involved with, and then also uh, various regulatory agencies. So it's a mess. So if we could, if we could improve, improve on that, you know, define a custom protocol, define a, uh, a common way to communicate, uh, share this information, then there can be one way that you ship this information out. And so it lowers the cost uh, one to to develop uh, these drugs and report information on it reports the, the overall regulatory expenses around having to maintain custom data for each type of uh, report that comes in, but also improves the overall patient care because the patient now, uh, well, you know, when they would report in and, and want to uh, get some type of diagnosis and say, oh, you're on this drug, and uh, the doctor physician now can have. Uh, up to the minute information because that's being reported through this common protocol uh, through these open APIs. Um, they can also get the information quicker into their system uh, without having to, you know, the time uh, loss and, and transforming the data across different formats. 
Uh, we see this across many different domains, but just showing a, a, a couple examples there. So I'm gonna spend a little bit more time now drilling into some details. Uh, so Mick showed some nice pictures of a high level view of integration of, of, of tools. And so uh, when we, we talk about this integration, it's actually motivated by, uh, if folks don't know, Tim Berners-Lee, who um, is, created, is uh, given credit for uh, inventing the, the web. Uh, so essentially the ability to link between websites and content. And so he's a, a very much a forward thinking on the way the web works. And he came up with this uh, proposal on, on a concept of linked data and what we're uh, talking about how we're using to integrate tools. So real simple concepts. So if you're gonna give something an ID, there's a, there's a naming convention, the Universal uh, Resource identif Identification System. So use a URI to identify it. And then we have one of those, um, provide some useful data by an HTTP access of it. And the third thing is if you're gonna provide data back and, and instead of maybe just being an HTML page which is uh, valuable for uh, a human reading it, but for a computer it'd be good to have a more descriptive uh, a format, so some type of RDF format. And then when you get that information back, provide links to other useful pieces of information. So Tim concludes by saying, you know, simple. So let's break it down what it really looks like at a, at a fine grained view of things. So as an example of the way you could say the web works today, uh, targeted towards human consumption, uh, you can read this piece of information saying, you could say I'm a tester, I'm responsible for tracking whatever the, the test case is against this product, and um, I might just build an HTML page to, to log the information, I might have a spreadsheet, I might write it down, a piece of paper, uh, I'm, however I might track it. And then I write down this information about uh, it, this relationship. So us as humans, we can read this, we can understand it. And there's other things, say I'm a, I'm a tester, like I, I, the previous example, I was at the water cooler, ran into my friend Joe and just happened to talk about open source and things, oh cool, he's a committer on, on Apache or right on a website, but these, these are interesting statements I learned out there. So uh, it's a typical, uh, Web 1.0, if you will, ways of learning things. But following uh, Tim Berners-Lee rule number one, uh, well, to help the computer understand, the computer understand this, we're going to give a URI to each one of these things. So uh, the test case has a URI. It might be uh, a HTTP URI to my internal tracking system. Either I, you know, my I build it myself, a buddy of mine at where I worked, I leveraged a piece of code he had. We bought a commercial grade tool, whatever it might be. It stores information about uh, the relationship to where, you know, the status of it and the fact that, you know, it's, it's blocked by uh, some other issue or thing out there. And then, of course, with uh, Joe as a committer, we see that uh, there. So then following on uh, rule two and also three, so we, obviously we see these are HTTP URIs and we can do gets on them. So let's, let's look up issue 973 and see what interesting thing we find there. So we learn uh, something, uh, it was like, well, that's actually, uh, maybe it's gonna be a while before this is fixed because it's actually dependent on a, a bug in another system. Um, and, and these are you know, made up interactions. So. <laughs> uh, that, so as a tester, I'm like, okay, this is good. I now need, know that I, it might be some time before this gets fixed. I might have to go chase someone down at the other, other end to uh, go see what's going on. But I also see something interesting that's like, Oh, uh, I see it's owned by my friend Joe, which, which was good. But, you know, if I didn't run into Joe, the, the water cooler, I wouldn't have known he was Apache Committer without being able to look it up. And I could even turn around and look up Joe and then learn from, you know, looking him up that he's a committer on the, on the Apache project. So uh, a simple example on uh, using linked data to uh, integrate the, the lifecycle of, of, of tools. Uh, you could take this, you know, uh, a step further and you can look at it in a in just a simple picture of what I just described in the uh, this the GORP on the previous slide as a, a graph of showing the relationships um, and then you can also expand on to that some of the examples that uh, Mick touched on where you see as these, these things are uh, you know blocked by a certain issue uh, you see a relationship to another bug but as uh, you tie in this into the build system that will 
uh, notify when it's ready to be tested, uh, available ready to test, then the tester then can have access to that information to then know uh, they can, can, uh, they're unblocked and can uh, continue to do what they need to do. So this is a big picture of, of linked data. So if you, we sort of looked at a very finite example within uh, ALM, but if we look at uh, what's going on in the world, if you will, of linked data, and there's a, there's the ability to publish data on the web, like linked open uh, data. There's this, uh, the link open data cloud.net that takes in data from many different sources, DBpedia, uh, IMDB, whatever, and, um, catalogs it, the size of the circle means how many, how much uh, data from that data set comes in, the coloring means from what area, what sector. So uh, if I could see here like green is uh, from the publication field. And so, you know, like a really small dot of a dot is probably the example I just showed. So then that's a view of just uh, linked data from a point of view of, of you know, what Tim Berners-Lee defined. So what, in order to make some of this real, um, we need to do a couple things to help. And so at uh, OSLC or Open Services for Lifecycle Collaboration, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're good at coming up with long, complicated names, so. Uh, but you can learn more about it at open-services.net. So l it's about linking the tools together. And it's not necessarily even about linking the tools together, it's about linking the data together and the tools operate on that data. So in order to do that, uh, we need to get together and agree on what some of these things are, what resources are, what properties they have, how they interact together. So what we do is uh, get together and describe what certain things are. So, so common resource definitions around what a bug might be or a change request, the fact that it might have a relationship to some other type of uh, record, such as a uh, a resource such as a requirement, some title, some simple information. So this is a simple example of what's out there. Uh, only that, then what, what do you need to do when you try to embed this information into a, say, a web application? Uh, oftentimes you have to build some type of presentation around these things when you just want a quick peek. So uh, instead of you know, loading the full HTML page for this resource, so we define um, this thing called a link preview. So giving standard HTTP content negotiation, which means the way the web works, right? So if a browser says, I want HTML, you get HTML. This says, uh, tells the, the uh, server that's hosting up, say this requirement data, give me a preview, and it gives a snippet of HTML intended to be included into your page. So you could think of this as you're in your, say, Bugzilla database, and you see a link uh, pointing out to something, you could mouse over it and see this, this pop-up hover giving you some more information. Then you could click into it and then get the full uh, uh, user experience in the, in the browser. And only that, when we're talking about integrating tools, one of the problems is how to find things in the other repository, uh, how to create them. Uh, some tools, uh, and I confess IBM's uh, overachieved in making it complicated to to create things programmatically sometimes in our, in our uh, defect tracking tools. So uh, we looked at it and said, well, we have these dialogues that exist in all our, our web applications. Uh, we really would like to place them in this other tool. So we defined a model out there that says, here's how you can take this dialogue for finding things and creating things and move it into this other application. So it's, in order to integrate this way, it's real simple. You just basically need to uh, create an iframe, load it, and put a listener in waiting for an event to come back. Uh, so uh, that's uh, my quick run through on uh, linked data and OSLC. Uh, I should say that some of the things we've learned from working on this in the open, we've gotten together uh, at the W3C to, to take Tim's four rules and try to actually standardize it and a working group called the Link Data Platform. And so, uh, starting in a workshop last year, got together with a number of folks, including uh, representations from, from Oracle, from uh, uh, CEMC, Nokia, I'm gonna forget a number of people. And then also we went from there and created a member submission to W3C, we're co-submitted with, uh, with EMC Oracle, uh, TASTOP, 
and then now we have an, an up and running working group. So we're, we're currently uh, iterating over a draft of a specification. So really trying to define a minimal set of, you could almost call it, uh, you know, to meet the buzzword requirement, you know, rest way of operating on, on open data. So a uh, lot of interesting things going on there and evolving at uh, W3C around standardization at, and OSLC at open-services.net. And I'll turn it over to Greg. Great. Thank you. Um, so we're going to get into uh, one of our demos, um, which will be showing an example of linked data in a closed system. Um, but before we get there, maybe we talk a little bit more about Hudson. Um, so Hudson, um, how many folks here are using Hudson today or Jenkins? Okay, so pretty much everyone. So this is a lot of this will be kind of review for you. Um, so Hudson is. Um, open source co continuous integration server. Um, and so it basically is uh, over the last year and a half or so, um, we've been transitioning it into um, the Eclipse Foundation to make it uh, a proper Eclipse project. Um, we're very close to being, having our first Eclipse release probably by the end of the month or so. Um, one of the values of Hudson is that it's very easy to install. It's just a war. You run on any application server and um, you basically have your build system ready to go. Um, one of the, it has a very simple web-based interface, and I think what draws most people to both Hudson and Jenkins is the plugin community. Um, so even within Hudson, there's about 450 plugins available, um, and they range from things like a Git repository plugin that will pull sources out of Git, pull them into your build, and um, integrate the change list, to things like you know Chuck Norris that will go and show you that Chuck Norris is mad that you broke the build. I mean, it's it really ranges the from the, the gamut for uh, the plugins. Um, and so Hudson CI, it's um, it's an, uh, it runs automatically. You can have it um, con integrate into any of your existing SCM systems, um, and it provides immediate feedback. You can configure it via um, multiple channels, including things like email. RSS news groups, and then it has a whole host of plugins that enable you to do things like reporting. So examples of those would be like Sonar, um, which is this, a big dashboard that integrates into Hudson and gives you a full set of test suite results and, and links through that. Um, so to get, see an example of this in action, I'm going to use the Oracle Developer Cloud Service. So Developer Cloud Service is a, um, a new feature that's part of Oracle Cloud. Um, and the idea behind it is it's giving you a turnkey-based solution in order to have a, a dedicated build system in the cloud. So, you know, typically when you're starting a new software project, you may have to work, you um, challenged with having to um, pull in your IT infrastructure to do things like get a source control system up and running. Uh, which build system, or you know, which build system do you want to use? Maybe I need a bug database, and I have to integrate that in some way. Um, but, and typically when you're doing this in-house, you have to have um, a team that's going to work with that. It's often a heterogeneous environment, disconnected um, tools that you have to try and integrate. Um, so what we're trying to do with uh, the uh, developer cloud service is provide you um, a standard uh, box with a core set of features, which include source control management, an issue tracking system, Hudson, and uh, Wiki. Um, so let's see a quick demonstration of that. So I am in the Developer Cloud Service main UI. So we're going to walk through an example of the different features. Um, so right now I've logged in as one of the users. I'm going to just maybe log in as a different user real quick. Maybe log in as myself. And so when I log into the system, what I, end up, what I see is um, my main project dashboard. And so as I'm configuring my team or creating my team, um, I can decide that the projects that I'm developing can be um, a different scope. So I can have private projects that only members of the team can view, or I can create organizational projects. So if my entire organization is configured within the cloud, then it is uh, basically an organizational public project enabling my entire group to participate in the, to, in the project, commit resources, update their tasks, things like that. So this is an example of 
um, a, a self-contained system that integrates Hudson and um, an issue tracking system and a, bug, uh, a source control system. And I'm going to show how we use, uh, do linked data to connect these different systems. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll go into the project and it will show me um, basically my project activities. So I see here where my sources are. I have a Git repository that I've created. I have a Maven repository I've created. Um, I can see that there are some activities going on within, my, within this project. Um, and I can click to any of these um, activities and then drill down into them. Um, so this is giving me from a home page a way to link to a specific module, an SCM check-in, a bug that's being updated, a build that's just completed. Um, but before we get to some of those, just we can also view um, our project more in a dashboard format, which gives us basically an overview of the health of the project. Who's doing commits and in what um, kind of in what percentage? You know, who's having a bigger role in this project? What's my open and close bug rate? What's my build status? And then I can also get into my check-ins. So I see here that on October 3rd, Lucas did a commit. Um, and so I'll click to this commit and it brings me into my source module and I see he added a whole um, Spring MVC example. And so I'll go, uh, go up here a little bit and um, I can see the diff. second. What was it? Oh. The browser's stuck. Yeah. Can you check it out? All right, let's do a quick refresh. Looks, the browser looks a little frozen. We'll bring Safari. All right, so let's go back to the source. So I can see in my source that I have, thanks, <laughs> um, that I have my list of commits. And so one of the commits that we added um, is that the user can create a task. So I'll click this um, commit, and then I see here that um, as part of my commit message, because um, I followed a convention where I'm referencing my task um, in my commit, then we're providing linking here. So uh, basically the system understands that there is a bug uh, that this commit is related to this bug and I can very easily drill down into that bug and I can see that it's linked here as well. So as I'm going and looking at the health of my project, I'm creating tasks, um, I can uh, associate commits with my tasks and then try and understand as I'm closing a bug, what were the, what were the um, changes that went into, the, into fixing this bug. Um, so maybe we'll create a new task and uh, look at an another example of linking within, within this system. Um, so maybe I'll create one for myself that is uh, create a new wiki. And I'll just assign it to myself here. So I've got a new task. Um, so to maybe resolve that task, I'll go and create this wiki page. So I'll go and I'm wiki module, create a new page. So we create the project. Um, but I haven't made an association. I, I, so I've created this project, I can go back to my task, but I don't have this traceability. Um, so maybe I want to go and make a, a, a link between these two. Um, so I'll go in back into my home, into my page, and maybe add a reference to that task. And so I just reference the task, and then we see that we have this linking between the two. So I see that um, between uh, I asso assigned a task to myself. I created this ta uh, created the wiki to fulfill the task. We have linking between the two, and then I'll go back and fix it.
So we've looked at ways that we can do linking between source code commits, between tasks, between our wiki and our tasks. Um, but as we're doing our builds, then we also are able to use linking capabilities inherent in Hudson plugins to also link to the rest of the application, the, sta the state of my project. Um, so I'll go into one of my builds and I see here that we um, had a successful build. Go into my recent change list. Um, okay, there were no changes for this specific one. Um, but as I'm going through my Hudson um, builds, I can review my uh, commits, look to see if they are linked to a specific task, and then link and then understand how that build uh, relates to the different bugs that I've closed. It's really useful if, uh, as I'm developing this project, if I've done a commit that actually broke the build, then I can see how um, the change lists impact the build and how what bugs were related to them. Thanks, Greg. So what you're seeing here, is, you know, what you saw right now is that using the simple linking format, we're just able to connect all these parts of the lifecycle. So any, you know, any issue that's been worked on, any requirements that is now linked, and all of that is visible through your builds. I'll show you just another instance of that, uh, this time from the developer's point of view inside the IDE. If we look at, just close some of this. If we look at, this is inside Eclipse, the Eclipse Milan project relies on exactly this simple linking format to automatically hook up your different lifecycle artifacts. So whether it's uh, connections in the task list between a defect and something that depends on an external system, we're using that exact same linking format for this. And you'll see how this actually shows up in your Hudson builds. So here I've got my, I'm um, connected in this case to uh, the Eclipse tools. So this is connected to an open source stack. We've got all of this now that's um, announced this week also working for the Oracle Developer Cloud Service. You can connect. As soon as you create your project in the Oracle Developer Cloud Service, you can connect your IDE to it. And you'll be connected to the Hudson instance, the Git instances, um, and uh, getting both your source code, your builds, and also your issues. All of that will be automatically provisioned into your IDE. Once you've got that, what I'm seeing here is uh, my Hudson builds. I see which ones are working, which ones are failing. And if I open one of these up, Note that all of the related artifacts of this build are linked and navigable in here. So I know I see every single defect that was addressed. And I see under that defect, so I can open up these defects. Oh, I'm not online. Um, but I, I could open up these defects in the task list. Let me see if any of these are cached or not. And I see all the changes under those defects. I can pull down the build failures and put them, for example, into my JUnit view. So all of this information is linked to the Hudson builds. And what's been happening here is that we're adding more and more of this linking to our build plans, our build systems. The Hudson server is becoming the centralized hub for you know, not only building, but linking all of the relevant artifacts for any build, for any release, for any chunk of your software. And the really neat thing is that tools like the Oracle Cloud Developer Service in the browser can expose all of this. And in this case, in the IDE, for this particular build, I know everything that's changed in it. This is actually a pretty long change list because this was a pretty comprehensive uh, list. The IDEs use this linking format, so no matter what SCM system I used, I actually see the source code changes to that as well. And again, all the, any artifacts that were there, uh, the console output, and the really neat thing is, you know, say, any failed tests. So I can instantly just run the failed tests from this build in my IDE without ever having to make a new JUnit test suite, having to do anything manually. We're just using this linking, and the IDs just become the switch client, follows those links, and will download all of the JUnit traces, and then instantiate the test cases inside your IDE. So all of this is now hooked up automated. This is where we are today. This is what you've got working in the Oracle Developer Cloud Service. And I think the big thing looking forward now is to actually start connecting to those external tools as well, because you might have some additional JIRA instances. You might have you know, your quality center. Uh, as the place where you host your defects. And the way we're going to do all of that is with exactly this format, this linked, uh, this linked data format, where we can link to things, refer to them, get enough information, in, and then decide whether you, know, you just expose those links inside a rich environment like this, whether in the cases of, of some of our commercial products like Task Sync, we actually move some of the data uh, between those different destinations. So that's uh, a summary. There's some really interesting layering that you can do on top of this uh, kind of linking, the contribution workflow. If you look for the Get Garrett Hudson talk, uh, that's another thing that we're looking at, adding to this tool chain, uh, is adding uh, uh, Garrett automation. Um, so what you can basically, I'm going to actually skip over that. There's a, thing, there's a good video online of that. And one thing I do want to emphasize is 
how the changes in the tool chain are enabling some of this additional linking to basically connect our source history to our task history. So just as an example of the way that this works in the Oracle Cloud Developer Service and uh, you know, the code to cloud tooling underneath it, some of the open source components like Hudson. Well, in this case, let's just focus actually on purely on the issue tracker in it and on the, um, on the version control system. So on Git underneath it. And I just want to let you know why Git is actually a very important part of this tool. What you've got when you're creating your products, whether it's that break system and that's the product, it breaks down to these requirements. If you're being more agile, it's user stories. Those all show up in your issue tracking and project management system, whatever you use for that. And at some point, they break down into work that you do when you're coding. And a key thing about these new ALM stacks that are forming is that this structure actually gets reflected exactly in the version control system. This is something that was never quite possible with the older version control systems like, like Subversion that we now have in Git and that we now have in, in these tools that you see today. So that commit corresponds to a task. The IDE tools do some automation for you. And that's one of the things that um, the Milan extensions for the Oracle uh, Developer Cloud Service do is they automatically set task IDs that are hosted in the task service for those commits. So that linking is automatic. The whole idea is that you never ever have to paste in that issue ID into a commit message because we're able to reflect that that's an automatically, because the tool knows which task you're working on because, again, it's a rich client to everything. For that, we can automatically create topic branches that correspond to, say, that user story. And that's, that's something that's not completed yet. It's something that we're working on now. It's basically automation to make sure that you're not deciding when to, take, to create branches. The tool already knows because it knows which user story that you're working on. And then that goes into the master branch, let's say, for that product. So this is basically you know, the way that we see the modern ALM stacks evolving to make sure that you know, when you're building your systems, the same way that we expect developers or contributors to our, our projects, um, our open source projects on Eclipse, to do this, this is getting done for you automatically inside the development tools. And you're getting the benefit of this fully connected um, and this full traceability across what you're using. And again, Hudson as the centralized engine where you can get everything from. That's why tools like Sonar uh, are so important, because they can, they can see your entire source base from Hudson. That's why these open formats like OSLC are important, because then a tool like Sonar, in addition, or extensions of Sonar, uh, can look at you know, both the requirements. And that can actually re can report on the requirements and see, let's say, which lines of code were not linked to any requirement, as an example. Uh, so with that, I think we can wrap up um, and take some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Rick. Yep. That's what I showed. Uh, I th the most straightforward way that all of this would work privately is if, if uh, with the you know, Oracle's made some mentions of a private cloud offering. Greg, maybe you want to speak to that? Yeah, so that's something that's on the, the cloud roadmap is, a, is basically a private pass solution. So you, the, basically the technology that goes into Oracle Cloud you could install within your IT infrastructure. You can, mm, for revenue recognition reasons, I can only say within the next year. <laughs> you can tell the lawyers that beat that one into me, right? <laughs> yeah, next question. Here? Uh, what you saw working today was, so there's I mean, all the automation, everything that makes it turnkey, that's the Oracle Developer Cloud Service. That's the, the whole packaging. It uses multiple open source components. So it uses, you saw Git, you saw a, lot, a bunch of Hudson, um, you saw the Mile extensions. You saw, uh, you saw Code uh, to Maven. Cloud. You saw Maven. Maven. Code yeah. to Cloud, yeah. Um, and then in the IDE, uh, you're just seeing, uh, this is actually just vanilla Mylan in the IDE, which can connect. It has extensions specific. So it's Mylan with connectors for the Oracle Developer Cloud Service. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, this With relation to linking? Yeah, yeah. So Hudson has a very rich um, set of pl uh, plugin, or plugin uh, community. So um, examples of plugins that will give you like data linking. Um, 
every SCM plugin, so Git, Subversion, CVS, all of them have their own standard of how they will link um, the build to change lists. Um, almost every bug tracking system has a plugin like Jira, like Bugzilla, that are also allow linking f to the build and a specific bug. Um, what we do in the developer cloud service is then we make that extra hop, right? We go from the, the check-in to the, uh, from the build to the check-in to the, to the bug. And, and all those plugins and, is, and, and tools actually use different formats for mm -hmm. linking mm -hmm. and different syntaxes and so on, which is, I think why some of what Steve is saying is so key that we end up with standards. So we're not you know, creating, any time that you want to create a Hudson reporting tool, you now have to write to those custom formats that those tools have been using. And some of them you know, will evolve over time as well. So having a common format for this will enable us to do a lot more in the, in the CI server uh, in terms of reasoning about our code bases and our, and our issue trackers and requirements and agile plans and the rest. Any other questions? OK. Oh, one more. Last one. <laughs> So Hudson 227, I think, is the most recent release. There's, you have just as many of the 450 plugins available, um, but we are in the process of finalizing 3.0. Um, one of the differences you'll see between 227 and 3.0 is that we've gone through and um, taken the top 50 plugins based on usage tracking that we have within, plug, within Hudson and um, done a, a quite a bit of QA and, and um, analysis on them to make sure that they work perfectly. So, um, so 3.0 will be a little bit more stable uh, when it's final. Thank you very much.